I have the alternator mounted on a couple of these brackets so that it can pivot and the pulleys are lined up so that they're nice and in line and now I just need a way to tension the belt and I'm sure there's a lot of ways to do that but I'm going to use this bracket that I bought since it is a universal alternator generator bracket I thought it would work pretty well and I'm just going to mount the bottom to a pivot down here on another one of these uh, L brackets here and just put the other end on the alternator. Once again I have to be careful to line it all up but that shouldn't be too much of a problem. There's the installed adjustment arm for my alternator and I have the belt what I think is properly tensioned. This large diameter pulley uh, on the engine and on the alternator means that I don't need to have nearly as much belt tension as you would in a typical alternator so I think this is plenty tight we'll find out. One thing I did notice however is that the platform that it's on, if I uh, pull the two, the alternator and the engine together, it bends slightly. I don't know if you can see that on camera, but it bends a little bit. So I may have to put some sort of bracing uh, on the bottom side of this, just across the middle where the belt is to prevent it from bouncing around, but I'll find out. Apparently three quarter inch MBF still isn't strong enough. And this is pretty strong stuff. Next I'll have to hook up the switches and all the wires and such, and then I should be ready to give this thing a test. I realize that I have still, after all of this time, not properly explained why I need a large sheave or pulley on my alternator. I had mentioned efficiency, and yeah, efficiency is great, but that's not the real reason why you need it. Uh, you don't necessarily need to match the power curve of the engine to the alternator like I'm trying to do here. The reason that you need this large pulley is because any automotive alternator, if you run it at full field current, which I have to do, just the way that this is set up, I cannot regulate my load, it will be running at full field, cur field current for a long period of time. Any automotive alternator that runs at full field current continuously will overheat if it runs at a high output current. So what I need to do is, a, is to have a way of regulating the output current from this alternator so that it doesn't overheat. As long as the rotor keeps turning, that full field current won't burn up the rotor. However, the statters will contribute to an overheat condition in the alternator after a while. So I need to be able to reduce the output of the alternator. One way to do that is to open up the alternator case and put a resistor in series with the field current, something like that. However. Because of the rather, rather brutal environment inside of an alternator, uh, 200 degrees Celsius wire and high vibration, uh, temperature cycling, all kinds of stuff, it really isn't very practical and wouldn't be reliable. So I need another way to do it, and that way is to slow the alternator rotation down. Now if I had a tiny pulley on here and a large pulley on the engine, I'd have to slow my engine down to 500 RPMs or something to get the alternator turning slow enough so that it doesn't overheat. And that just wouldn't be practical. Engines like this idle at about 1800 RPMs. If you turn them over slower than that, first of all, they hardly produce any power at all. And secondly, they uh, don't oil properly. This is a splash lubricated engine and it needs to run at around 1800 RPMs or faster or it will not lubricate properly. So I really want to run this, like I said, at around 2500 RPMs. Faster is acceptable, but that's kind of what I'm shooting for here. So, if I run this at that speed, in order to get the alternator to turn slow enough, the alternator produces 60-80% uh, to 80 of its output at about 2500 alternator RPM. I need to run it at that. And in order to do that, I need to have a larger sheave on the alternator. And that's why I need this larger pulley. Not necessarily for efficiency, although that is a nice byproduct. Because as I said, alternators like this, in their typical configuration, are only around 50% efficient. If you do this sort of thing, they get quite a bit more efficient, 65% uh, or so, the peak around 70, but you won't really see that. I have no way of measuring efficiency, but if you look at alternator efficiency curves on the internet, they're rather hard to find, but they do exist, you'll see that they do peak at close to 70%. Anyway, I just wanted to explain that quick because I don't think I adequately explained it before. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead now and continue to hook this up. The alternator is all hooked up, everything is all set up, and I'm ready to do my initial test of my 
belt drive 12 volt generator. As far as the additional connections that I had to make, terminal 2 is the reference. This time I did not get them mixed up, notice. Terminal 2 is the reference if you don't connect it on a typical alternator, a Delco Remy style alternator. This one will simply internally reference the output terminal. You could run a wire from here all the way out to your battery, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to let it reference internally. This is set up to be 14.8 volts or so, which is higher than I'd like anyway, so I'm perfectly fine with some voltage drop in my wire. Uh, this terminal controls the field current. These normally don't start generating until you attach something to here. Now normally this will go to your ignition switch through a light resistor in parallel combination. Um, you can look up why that is if you're interested. But uh, normally it goes to that. I don't have an ignition switch, so I have a switch here. Most people would connect this up through a toggle switch because that mimics an ignition switch. But I don't want to use a toggle switch because with a toggle switch you turn it on and as soon as the engine stops, it continues drawing current from your battery. Also, with a toggle switch, if you don't put a resistor in series, you're running full field current through your alternator. And if it's not turning, it doesn't cool and you'll burn up your rotor. So what I did instead to solve these problems and make it simpler is to simply put in this momentary switch that I had tried earlier and it didn't work, at least on that Chinese alternator. Now with this switch, I've tested it out. If you hold it in, it does draw full field current when it's off, and it's about uh, 3 or 4 amps. Uh, you let it out, it goes back down to zero. So what I plan on doing is just starting up the engine. Everything will turn without a load. All I have to do is hit this switch, and the alternator should turn on. Because all it takes is one little pulse, and it will, uh, from then on, it'll just supply itself until it gets shut off, and then everything turns off and it doesn't drain your battery. That's the plan, at least. I kept the same setup here. I'm fusing the ground instead of the positive because it was easier to do. I have this thermal couple meter down here, and I once again have it taped to some high temp tape right onto the alternator so I can monitor the alternator temperature. This uh, laminated silicon steel insert here, not the case temp, but this temp. And I'll see, once again, try and keep that below 150 C. I would hope that this alternator does much better than the last one, because that was pretty bad. Uh, it is a larger case size with a lower output, um, and it's an original part, it's not some aftermarket thing. I also have a voltmeter hooked up to my battery over here, and I have an inverter and a heater for a load, just like before. So I'm going to fire this up again. Uh, oh, and I have my tack over here on the floor. This is all temporary. If it works out, I'll make it more permanent, but it's all ready here. I'm going to fire it up, and I'll let you know how it goes. I tested it out, and this momentary switch that I have here works exactly like I'd expect now that I'm using a true Delco Remy alternator instead of some Chinese one-wire knockoff that really doesn't work properly, i found. It, uh, it, it works exactly like I expect. So I start the engine. The alternator turns but does not generate. You push this button, it's a momentary switch, I put in the momentary switch, like I said, instead of the toggle switch. And uh, you push the button in, it starts generating. As soon as the engine shuts off, the thing goes dead, and it draws no current from the battery. The reference terminal up here is not connected, it's not needed. It just references the output terminal, and that works just fine. I ran my 12-volt generator set up for about 15 minutes, just like I did before with the other alternator, the direct drive jaw coupling setup that I had. And this time it was far more effective with this belt setup. There were still a few issues, but I'll get into those. I learned a few things about this. First, this alternator, this 27SI, is way more efficient than that little 10SI alternator. And to give you an idea of the size difference, This is the 10SI, this is the 27SI. The diameter is only an inch or so different, but it makes a huge difference in the mass. And this large alternator worked much, much better. I'm not sure if that's because the 10SI that I bought was an aftermarket part, or if this one is simply that much more efficient. But I ran this alternator at its maximum load, which ended up being about 70 or 80 amps.
uh, for for that duration and the case temperature um, I put a thermocouple on it just like before with some high temp tape which apparently I didn't need this time but I put that on there and the case temperature only got up to about 70 degrees Celsius and it held there so this alternator uh, to correct an earlier statement that I made really is capable of doing full field full output current continuously without overheating and that is pretty impressive most alternators don't handle that very well this one handles it very very well even in a hot engine compartment there would be no problems at all so I am uh, very happy with its performance and it's also much more efficient um, well it stayed cooler and it's not because the cooling fan cooling was that much better this fan is superior but it's not that much better no this alternator is just much much more efficient than this little dinky guy on the floor over here so it's obviously a much better choice for a generator setup like this on the engine over here uh, I just have my tack on the floor for now because I don't have anything permanently mounted yet but this engine would not stall no matter what I did with the alternator this time it had plenty of power so like I said the efficiency is just that much higher with this alternator so at uh, 2000 RPMs, which is basically idle, it idles at 1800, the alternator output around 50 amps. Uh, at 3600 RPMs, it did about 80 amps. And around 2500 RPMs, where I plan to run it, it does around 70 amps. So this alternator here, uh, if you look at the part code on it, stamped into the case, and also the amperage rating stamped into the case, it is a 100 amp alternator however in my testing it's only an 80 amp alternator now this is really old it's probably been rebuilt by some aftermarket part house uh, before and most likely they mixed up the case and the innards so this is apparently the 80 amp model because the 27 SI-100 came in both 80 and 100 amps so I might just end up having to go buy a 100 amp version of this to get my desired 80 amps out of it and keep this one as a backup it does seem to work just fine so maybe I won't rebuild it after all like I said the brushes were in pretty decent shape and I don't know about the bearings but I guess when they go they go you'll notice some miscellaneous heavy things around here that's because unfortunately this thing still wanted to walk across the floor with a floor jack over here and a bag of potting soil over here it didn't move anymore but I'm somewhat disappointed in the smoothness of this engine. It runs fairly rough and it vibrates quite a bit. In a lot of applications that may not be a problem, but it, uh, and in any single cylinder engine, it's going to vibrate quite a bit, but this seems to vibrate a little bit more than I would expect. So I'll have to figure something out to keep this card in place, um, but that's a job for another time. One thing I wanted to mention here on belt drives, since I didn't really mention this yet, uh, talking about efficiencies, one of the reasons I like to do the direct coupling method was for efficiency. That is nearly 100% efficient to use a jaw type coupling. V belts like this are, and that is much looser than it used to be. This must have stretched a little bit in its first use. I'll have to retension that. But uh, V belts in use, if they're properly tensioned and properly aligned, are typically, these A style belts, are typically about. 95% efficient. I have no way to measure the belt efficiency here, but it certainly does get warm, so I know it's losing some power. But belt drives are typically 95% efficient. If they're not properly tensioned or aligned, they're a little bit less. And because of the torque characteristics of this engine, I'm sure it's quite a bit less in my application. But there are two main places that belts like this lose power. One way that belts lose power is by losing speed. They actually slip a little bit and that's by design and it's because it's necessary in order to transfer power across a moving object you have to have slip and I won't get into the details of how that works however I'm gonna walk over here and show you a tire if you go and look up slip angle as it pertains to automotive wheels and tires that exact same principle applies to V belts now, slip angle specifically talks about lateral forces on a tire, but if you accelerate, for example, your wheel actually turns faster than the linear speed of the outer diameter of your tire, outer circumference of the tire, and if you brake, it turns slower. 
and that slip is necessary in order to transfer those forces through a distance. The same thing happens on a V-belt, you lose some speed, and that speed ends up being lost power. Another place that they lose power is the more obvious, you lose some torque. This belt doesn't bend all that easily. If you take the belt and bend it back and forth rapidly, it takes some work to do that. And this thing is flying around the pulleys at a pretty good, good pace when this is turning 3,000 RPMs or so. And just bending the belt back and forth takes some power, so you lose some torque. In any case, you lose about uh, 5 to 10% of your power in the belt. Unfortunately, I ended up having to go with the belt setup, but uh, I just thought I'd mention that. So even with those losses in the belt, this alternator still was that much more efficient than the other one. Much, much more efficient. I don't know how much. I can't measure that. I don't have a way to measure it. But this engine had no trouble whatsoever powering this alternator at 80 amps. So I am confident that it would easily be able to power a 100 amp version as well. Another thing I want to mention, just as a curiosity, I did run this right here inside my garage here, with the garage door about halfway open. And I was in the garage the entire time while it was operating. Now, it's a bad idea to run an engine of any sort inside a semi-enclosed space, like a garage, even with a massive opening like this garage door, because these do emit enormous amounts of carbon monoxide. And I was just kind of curious how quickly that carbon monoxide would build up in this garage, because I'd never really done a test like that before. And I do have over here in my messy bench a little battery-powered carbon monoxide detector. And after running for about 15 minutes, this did make it up to 150 ppm. Now, 150 ppm for a short time like that isn't whatsoever dangerous. In fact, this thing, which is extremely conservative in when it alarms, uh, never beeped at all. But I just uh, thought that was interesting to mention. Uh, and then after I shut the engine off, within five minutes, this went back down to zero. So it was well ventilated, but even with the garage door halfway open, you wouldn't want to stay in here for hours on end. It would... Uh, would probably be a dangerous situation. So these things really do need to be run outdoors. Um, I just thought that was interesting. I did that for my own sake and thought I'd include it in the video. So I did record some video of this running, but it's pretty boring for YouTube viewing and also it's pretty loud and annoying. So I omitted those clips, but uh, that's why there are no, or at least very few shots of this setup running. I've largely completed construction of my 12-volt generator, and there are a few things left to do. Uh, I need to clean up the wiring, for example. Um, I should do a long-term burn-in and stress test to shake out any remaining bugs that may exist. Uh, I would like to see what kind of fuel consumption this setup has at various output levels. Uh, things like that, but for the most part, the generator is done. And I do have other plans for this setup. Uh, additional projects involving it, but I don't know if I'll record those or not, so I would like to wrap up this video at least for now. Thanks for watching.